again the weekly Mac third season. Let's switch on your English. Today our main issue is architecture. Our first guests are two important architects, Paula Sula Morales and Arietti Marco Polo. Patricia Scalona and Donna Coturnan are going to argue about whether it's better to live in a big city or in the country. And if you like music, real music, today we have here a string quartet that even angels adore, the Casals Quartet, live in our stage. And of course, Marco Motero, Matthew Tree, Mark Broderick and our dearest Marcella Topor. Hello, it's so nice to be here with you again. We start our third season with a very special show today and our main subject is architecture. Finding a nice, cheap and efficient house is not easy as we all know. In a way, this complicates our chances of living in dignified conditions and raises many questions about the right to housing and the pricing policies. And today we have invited two architects to talk about these and other issues. However, you should see the following glossary of words first because they will appear throughout the interview. Speaking about architecture, we start this glossary with the verb to inhabit. If a place or region is inhabited by a group of people or animals, those people or animals live there. Pay attention to the second word, landmark. A landmark is a building or feature in the landscape which is easily noticed and can be used as a guide. Let's have a look at the phrasal verb, to show off. It means to exhibit or display so as to invite admiration. If you say that someone is showing off, you are criticizing them for trying to impress people by showing in a very obvious way what they can do or what they own. Still another verb to finish the glossary, to foster. To foster something such as an activity or idea means to help it to develop, to promote its growth. When planning a building, a huge number of factors must be considered. They will influence in its quality, its energy efficiency, its price, its durability and its design. Pau de Sola Morales is a Catalan architect and president of Arkin Fad and Areti Marcopoulou is a Greek architect and the academic director of Institute for Advanced Ar Architecture in Catalonia. Areti and Pau, welcome. First of all, Areti, you're Greek. How long have you been living in Barcelona? I have been living here for 13 years. Mm -hmm. And um, what do you think of Barcelona's architecture? I think Barcelona is, is a great place uh, for architects, but also for urban uh, visioners. This is the reason that I came uh, here in Barcelona to study about um, architecture and urbanism. Barcelona is the city that, that invented urbanism and, and um, I consider that it is also a city that continues, continuously innovates in the way that um, uh, designs and plan the, the, the space for citizens and for, uh, uh, you know, like what comes into the future of our cities. Mm -hmm. Okay, Paolo, do you agree? Yeah, um, I think that it, uh, Barcelona has a great tradition in, um, in urban design, in, in thinking the city, in, um, in taking the risk to transform it, mm -hmm. as have other great cities in Europe probably. Uh, sometimes uh, doing it with, with these other great cities. Uh, Barcelona also has the pride of, of, of doing this. And, and this is important because uh, there is no urban change that, uh, that is good if people don't feel that uh, it's what they want. So. Okay. What is an architect today? An artist, a designer, and how has this job evolved over the years? We, we, we're trying to set the vision that the architect is not a scientist, neither an architect, uh, but that he is something in between. He is uh, trained and capable of giving par particular solutions to given problems. Uh, and he does, architects usually do this in the field of, of construction, of uh, buildings, of uh, also the city. So being able to um, think of possible solutions to uh, construction problems or to urban problems, that would be the main role of the, of the architect. Well, to me, architect, the architect has always been, um, on the one hand, uh, a visionary person, because architecture is not only building buildings and forms, 
but it's uh, radically uh, changing and influencing the way that people inhabit, but also the way that people interact. Um, it also radically uh, impacts um, our, our uh, let's say, ecological footprint. Of course. So um, architecture um, is becoming not a simple discipline, but a kind of a more complex discipline that should be open to others, which is why the second important thing for an architect is that uh, he or she should also be a mediator, a curator. So um, I see the architect as the person that um, uh, break, brings the needs of all the different agents that surround mm -hmm. um, uh, the built space, uh, but also brings um, uh, the knowledge that uh, comes from different disciplines in order to innovate f into, into mm -hmm. architecture. Of course. Well, Arete, tell me about your job. You're a member of the Institute for Advanced Architecture in Catalonia. What does this institute do? Well, um, uh, the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia is a research and educational center. So we are um, actually a non-profit foundation that we are um, educating on the one hand. So we are offering different okay. kind of academic programs. And on the other hand, we are researching in order to understand how the digital age or even the post-digital age, mm -hmm. how the technological revolutions can um, impact the way that we um, design, build and manage our build spaces yes. so um, we are working from uh, uh, big um, uh, European research uh, funded projects to small uh, projects about the community and about uh, okay. local um, circumstances I see and uh, Pao you are the president of Arkinfad you can tell us what uh, is this organization Arkinfad is an organization that belongs to the larger FAD in English the the, the, the letters stand for uh, fostering the arts and design. Uh, it's a it's a hundred year old uh, organization that since the early well yeah early nineteenth twentieth uh, century has been trying to precisely foster the the different types of design. At the beginning was more arts and crafts, but right now it's more design, industrial design, graphic design, and also architecture and, and interior design. Okay. So trying to cover all these all these. Uh, uh, range of, of disciplines plus the arts. Uh, we are trying to do whatever we can to make them visible and to make them uh, better uh, and also to make them visible to society. Mm -hmm. I see. What is a smart building? Hmm. Hmm? <laughs> um, a lot of things. Um, Different people uh, could define that in a different way. And now it's a very fashionable term, no? Everybody talks about these intelligent flats, intelligent buildings, smart buildings, but what are they exactly? No? I think that <clears throat> um, all this electronic and digital technology has helped uh, in interact, let's say, uh, a, a little bit better with our flats. Uh, with our apartment, with our with the spaces we inhabit, but but it's also a term that is has been coined by the uh, you, you know the marketing uh, uh, marketing uh, uh, industry, let's say, or, or even the construction industry, to try to make the, all these buildings really seem intelligent. And and I think it's very it's very good that we find ways that this technology can help us, uh, especially in, in all those repetitive tasks from, you know, setting on the, the heating from, yes. from this to uh, mm -hmm. maybe, I don't know, uh, making sure that the, the house is safe and there's no uh, water leakages or, or, or this kind of thing. So technology can that help us. That make our lives easier, no? Make, make them easier, uh, make, make them uh, detect things that we cannot detect, make, make it, uh, make this technology or remind uh, us about things that we could remind forget. us uh, turn on or off things when we are not there and, and we can okay. do it remotely so it's a it's a great help mm -hmm. what about climate change and architecture how has climate change influenced architecture hmm. architecture basically houses and buildings are one of the major co consumers of energy and we have to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not an expert, but I know that we have to change a lot of things that we have done in the past. Uh, really, probably nobody knows how. 
Uh, we love light, but we need to make windows smaller or thicker at least. Uh, th this kind of reflections, mm -hmm. this kind of thinking has to get into our heads uh, because we have a great um, responsibility in this because the construction uh, industry is such a uh, great user of, uh, of energy. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that um, rather than how climate change impacted architecture, I think it's the opposite, how architecture impacted mm, the, the yes, climate. Yes, that's a good no? point because, as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, our buildings in our cities, they are um, consuming organisms of energy. They are the ones that they are emitting more than 45% of the whole amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So they are contaminating, let's say, agents, our buildings. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the building industry um, uh, is responsible for a big percent, that's like 40 or 50, depends on where you are in the planet, mm -hmm. percent of the total waste that we're generating. Yes. So uh, architecture uh, is impacting very in a very negative way um, our climate, which is why we need to radically rethink how we design, which are the materials that we are designing, but of also course. what can architecture do rather than consuming resources, mm -hmm. how it can be more productive, which also comes to the previous question of smart buildings, because yes. smart buildings, the first thing that they need to do is to perform as intelligent organisms that they are able to generate resources mm -hmm. or to save uh, resources or to manage resources exactly. in a more mm -hmm. um, optimized way. Mm -hmm. You mentioned materials, new materials. Uh, there has been a lot of talk lately about uh, stuff like, um, I don't know, breathing skin, if you can tell me what that is, or hydro membranes. Um, what, uh, mater how are materials changing? Um, these new materials, what are they and how, how can they be more efficient and more sustainable? Well, I, I, I guess that the idea of new materials is that uh, science and technology can give us materials that respond differently to the environment mm -hmm. um, because they are more insulating, because they reflect the light in different ways, because they uh, maybe reflect light and, and let uh, uh, vision through. Yes. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, things that we, ha we hadn't th thought of before. Um, and there's lots of these materials. We are just, uh, let's say, opening the box. Okay. Uh, and finding them. The problem is that some of these materials will probably be expensive or difficult to apply. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of uh, way to, to, uh, yes. to explore. I see. What's your favorite material to use in a building? <laughs> Oof. Something more natural, something more, I don't know, that involves more technology. I am more for uh, natural materials and I am also more uh, towards um, thinking how we can use expertise of the past but you know enhanced technologically with what uh, possibilities we have today. Okay. A big part of the work uh, that we are doing is uh, uh, including for instance building with uh, earth, with um, uh, clay, with material that we can find yes. on site. Uh, which was something that in vernacular architecture has been very, very um, uh, well explored. But today it rather seems that it is uh, so solutions for more poor areas, no? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I also believe that materials can should start change the way that people think um, um, they can influence their, their way of life or mm -hmm. even their status. And then there are different kind of materials that they are able to change properties. So if we bring from material science, graphene is the material of the future. Mm -hmm. um, uh, materials that they can uh, absorb water and then evaporate yes. it during night, you know? Like, we can acquire uh, passive systems for passive heating and, 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 and cooling, which would also allow us to minimize the amount of artificial cooling and heating systems that we use in our yeah. buildings. That's and, pretty and amazing. That's, that's great. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can continue this conversation about architecture later, but now we need to move on to a new, uh, to a new section. But before that, tell me about your English. Where have you, what did you learn it? Where did you study it? And if you practice it a lot? Um, when I was uh, young, when I was uh, 11, I had the opportunity to go to the United States with my family for okay. one year. That was like my first introduction to English. But I think that, uh, uh, the, the English I speak now, although I am losing it, but uh, was, uh, was, uh, I got it from uh, four or five years of study that I spent in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Which area? In, in Boston. Okay. Mm? Arati? Um, I studied English when I was young. In Greece, we all speak English. We learn English from TV, from music, from yeah. uh, Greek people speak studying uh, and very from good reading. English. Very good English in yeah, Greece. because nobody else in the world speaks Greek, so we need to communicate <laughs> with the rest of the world. <laughs> I good wish. point. Okay. Our goal is precisely to help people who have uh, some English notions to improve a little bit every day. And for instance, do you know the difference between flow and story? This, among many other things, is what Professor Helen Armstrong from International House Barcelona tells us in the following tip. Take good note. Hi, today we're talking about architecture, and I'm sure you already know some basic vocabulary such as room, door, window. But we're going to look at building. So first of all, you need a lot, which is the space of land that you'll build on. And when you're building, you start with the foundations. It's the starting point of your building, and you build up towards the roof. Now, the roof is the top of a building, not to be confused with the ceiling, which is the top of a room, which I can see from indoors. So from the ceiling, I can also see the floor. But floor also has two meanings. So it can also mean the different levels of a building. Also, we can use the word story for this purpose. So I live on the second story of my building. Now, to get from story to story, we use the stairs or the stairway, which is the passage. Um, and also, we can use the word steps, which is a similar meaning, but they refer to stairs outside. So, learning a language, take it step by step. Bye. Apparently, in megacities, you have access to anything you can imagine, or don't you? Patricia and Donica discuss the benefits and problems of living in a megacity. Our guests today are Aretti, Marco Polo and Pau de Sula Morales, both architects. And we are chatting with them about housing and the future of building. And at this moment, we welcome our collaborator, Malcolm Otero. Hello. Hello and welcome. And by the way, um, have you ever had to deal with an architect? I'm still saving. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So no, I, All right. I rent my house, so I don't have any project for the moment to build a new house for me. Mm -hmm. So, what interesting anecdotes about architecture have yeah. you brought to us will, today? Uh, first thing I want to start is with the skyscrapers. Skyscrapers? Because, I mean, the history of the skyscrapers has been defined by the competition of building the tallest building. And it was quite childish. And now, each, the, the, the focus is on design and on the signature, obviously. I mean, there are, now there are buildings of more than 800 meters, but the importance is on the, on the design. So it's like the new, they're, they're, they're seeing like uh, artworks. I mean, they're seeing like the really artworks. So do you really think cities are more beautiful with the skyscrapers? Mm, good question. Well, first of all, the, the, the race for the tallest skyscraper has been uh, started probably when, when technology precisely uh, allowed it. Mm -hmm. In the early 20th century, probably, uh, steel and, uh, and different construction technologies probably uh, made it possible. And the elevator. And the elevator, exactly, which is another technology. Now the race is a childish race, at least in my, uh, under my point of view, like the, having the greatest uh, mosque or the largest uh, soccer uh, stadium or the, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, there's all these yeah, competitions that, like that height forms of uh, power and some forms of showing off. Yes, uh, exactly. Showing off is the from, word. From <laughs> uh, cities, administrations or whoever, or, or particulars or companies probably. You know? So what's the highest uh, skyscraper in the world at the moment? Is it uh, <laughs> the, the uh, still in, yes? in, in, uh, it's, it's in, in Dubai in or in Dubai. the... In Bush Khalifa, Bush Khalifa. Yes. Khalifa yeah. I think, yeah. You know, the, the issue with skyscrapers, um, it's also for me, um, a necessity of, of giving solutions to the 
uh, urban growth um, of population, you know, like uh, every, every time more and more people want to live in cities and then the population is growing exponentially. So building vertically is actually a solution of how um, uh, cities could host more and more people. And if we think that cities are also fostering growth because the majority of GDP is accumulated in cities, um, then uh, finding solutions of how urban environments can host more people mm -hmm. is fundamental and there skyscrapers is important um, uh, to work with but not so much as landmarks or, or as, as a competition of designs and height but rather more than uh, functional um, um, and, and, and smart structures that also you know use these different kind of materials and in a way, being in such height, they can do much more things than hosting people, you know? mm -hmm. such That's as, good. for instance, generating energy through wind or, or, or um, um, you know, like uh, generating resources. Mm -hmm. Well, Malcolm, I think you got your answer. Yeah, I do. Let's talk about the, the, this kind of star system. You know, the, the, the star system of art has been somehow diluted and now the new stardom is made up with uh, chefs and architects, basically. With the, but are they real so original? Because, for instance, if I see the tower by Foster in London, and I see that back tower here by Nobel, for me it's quite the same. So don't we need a, a, a generic copyright like, <laughs> let's say, phallic buildings, Foster? <laughs> um, I don't know, impossible curves like high with LSD, Gary. Uh, I don't know, pieces of everyone, Calatrava. Don't we need something like that? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let me again take the more historical point of view. Uh, I think that we have a, a, an idea of architecture as art that comes from the 19th century, from the kind of romanticism where the genius of the architect had to give uh, these uh, uh, this distinction from the other one. So everybody had to be original because the genius helped you be so. And then this has grown to form a star system where these uh, architects seem to be geniuses that are always original and always uh, great. So what they say are all, is always a great, a great saying. Okay? Uh, and I think we have to kind of begin to forget all, all this because it's uh, outmoded, completely, completely old. Uh, and we have to begin thinking that architects are very well-trained uh, professionals, that they can do a lot of different things, and that they copy. Because we always look at other architecture, we spend many, many years uh, studying this, the history of architecture, looking at magazines, looking at uh, TV programs, everything, and learning from what the others do. So no, it's no wonder that there are similar buildings because there are influences, and we have to accept that. It's normal. Uh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> Let's talk now about mistakes. Mistakes? Mistakes. No, mm. the, the Tower of Pisa was a mistake, but ended up being wonderful. <laughs> but it's not always the same. Remember that building in London <clears throat> made by Rafael Vignoli, which was like a giant magnifying glass that melted even cars. Uh, I mean, people, <laughs> uh, people call the building the walkie-talkie because of the shape, but ended up calling it Barnzilla because it was, it was like, a, like a monster. And we made, we made a, we'd done a survey and all the possible names were inverted catalytic stuff at the accordion. <laughs> but, but, or or the, the Ian Simpson building in Manchester yeah, with uh, makes well. such a loud noise that people in the neighborhood uh, go wear, wearing earplugs so they don't talk to each other. So the building is, is provoking communication problems. Um, so there's, there's even what's the problem? The wind, no? It the made wind, noise. In windy days, it's yeah. so, windy day. so loud that people. I mean, I have some. There's some in YouTube. You can find videos about the, the sound. It's very, very annoying. And but the, the, let's say that Ian Simpson. There's a counter, an apology counter that he at least 137 times say I'm sorry about it. <laughs> but the question is, how is it possible? Because there's many people, highly training trained people work in every building. How, how is it possible that they didn't, uh, they are, weren't aware about the relationship between the weather and the building, etc.? Yeah, 
Good I mean, question. like the, the building, the building industry is a complex uh, industry, and the sector is not um, as, um, uh, let's say, as easy as to say there is the architect uh, that made a mistake, or you know, like there is the building constructor that did a mistake. So there is like a kind of a lot of different agents that they take place in in uh, in uh, building uh, management and construction. I think that for many years those agents, they were segmented. Okay. No? So the designer was designing in their office um, with very little connection with what was coming after. Mm -hmm. They were delivering a design and then the construction company probably taking it in order to, you know, like uh, build it with their team with very little super supervision many times from the architecture apart. So all those uh, agents that they were segmented today um, are actually coming closer and closer because there are different tools that they are coming from technology such as the building information modeling and no need of getting into technical details but there are now tools that people can actually all work with one model no, so that everybody can have access into that model yes. and then mistakes can be avoided, can be avoided. and, and mm. also environmental uh, parameters can be analyzed from the very beginning so that the building can be a response to the environment rather than, you know, like a burden to mm -hmm. it. That, that brings us a question I have prepared for you about the training in Spain. I mean, it's very technical and not so artistic mm -hmm. in Spain. Is that good? We should train the, the architects more like an Alvar Alto or more like an engineering. I mean, an engineer. That's uh, very important because a lot of times I hear that in Spain they are very technical and not so artistic. What do you think about it? Oh. <laughs> uh, okay. The the, the, tr the training in, in in Spain, the training of architects in Spain is is both technical and with a huge concentration on what we call projects, which is this uh, creative act that uh, allows to put solutions to, to problems. Uh, it, is, uh, it is very good when you confront this act of projecting, uh, of designing, that you have a very good technical knowledge. Uh, it is good that a graphical designer knows very well how of print course. works and how paper is and how inks work. Uh, so f the same for architects. The problem is that the architect is responsible for so many things that probably uh, he cannot cope with all of this. I mean, we're, we're trying to make a huge, a, a, a mega, a mega uh, technical person and probably it's not possible, you know? Uh, and this idea also comes from the French, uh, old French uh, tradition of, uh, uh, of polytechnical schools where you had this mega, ultra, uh, super techni te technical technicians. Mm -hmm. And probably we have to abandon a little bit this idea that one person can do everything, you know? Probably collaboration, as we were talking before, is a better way to to uh, address these uh, complex problems. Yes. Well, before we uh, go to uh, another section, I have a question for both of you. First of all, uh, Pau, how do you think Barcelona has changed? Uh, I mean, the architecture in Barcelona has changed in the past 20 years. And Areti, how do you see Barcelona in the next 20 years? Okay. Um, well, Barcelona in the last 20 years uh, probably has not changed a lot. <laughs> uh, it, it, it has, but, uh, uh, but probably it has lingered with ideas of the late 90s. Uh, and maybe with not, not a lot of new ideas have been put on the table. Okay. Many have, and many probably have, are sleeping uh, on, on, on offices and, and other places. Uh, the city is like trying to find a new uh, model of, of itself. I see. I am, I am pretty optimist about the future of Barcelona and in general about the future of cities. I bike every morning to go to work and uh, the last year I have been seeing all these kind of weird 
uh, individual electrical vehicles emerging. So, you know, like people are taking power of finding their way to uh, alternative mobility systems, more sustainable mobility systems. Um, uh, also, you know, like people taking over parks and squares to create big dinners, so public spaces also, mm -hmm. you know, like being uh, um, uh, redefined and reactivated every time more and more by the same people rather than by a top down process. Uh, of the city council. So to me, I see Barcelona in 20 years from now that is um, um, even more human than it is today. Uh, it is serving the people. Uh, the public space is, uh, is even greater uh, and even greener. And um, uh, you know, like um, uh, contamination is less. And, and we people uh, as well, we, we take uh, responsibility on our actions and our impact on, on the cities. No? So we think twice how we move, we think twice how we spend energy, money, you know, like uh, resources. Mm -hmm. But what about the prices of the houses? Will they be lower as well <laughs> in the future? Oh, wow. That's the, that's, the same, that's the same problem that with the skyscrapers. <laughs> like Areti said, uh, the city attracts so much, let's say, energy, uh, people, ideas, that everybody wants to live close by and, yes. and this generates these uh, prices and on top of that we have added uh, the um, uh, the forces of global capital which are also distorting all these uh, and not only that the forces of tourism so you know um, okay i see so that was a difficult question mm, a probably. question difficult to answer <laughs> <laughs> difficult yeah okay before we go i have a question for you a last question for the three of you actually have you ever been to nigeria no, never. It was in a, in, a, in a earth connection, I mean, in a flight connection. I can't say I've been to Nigeria. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I was asking that because in today's e-speaker section, we are visiting Nigeria, which is located at the extreme inner corner of the Gulf of Guinea on the west coast of Africa. And it is the most populous nation on the continent. About one fifth of Africans are from Nigeria. The modern state originated from a British colonial rule beginning in the 19th century. So let's learn more about this country with uh, Curtis Aguedo. Hello everybody. Uh, my name is Mr. Curtis Aguedo. Um, of Benin from Benin City, Edo State of Nigeria, obviously the biggest West African country in the continent of Africa. And I live here in Barcelona for a period of 18 years now. It happens to be the biggest country in Africa with the highest population in Africa. We're talking about a country that is one of the richest in mineral resources in Africa, one of the highest oil exporting countries in Africa, with very good landscape, comprising of both the rainforest, a bit of the desert in the north, with a lot of green vegetation around the southern part of the country. Whoever is visiting Nigeria should visit our federal capital Abuja, which is a very modern city with a spectacular mountainous rock overlooking the entrance of the city that is called Zuma Rock. I would also recommend that they visit the Calabar Ranch, which is a very beautiful tourist set. I would also recommend that you visit the Obudu Ranch, the Yankari Reserve, and I also recommend that you go to Benin City, where I come from, to visit the traditional moat, which was what was used in defending the city against foreign invasions. Of course, there are so many more that one can visit in Nigeria. Nigeria being a colonial country of Britain, a lot of gentlemen, respected gentlemen, helped in negotiating our independence from the colonial powers. We're talking about Dr. Onandi Azikiwe, we're talking about Dr. Um, 
uh, Thai Solari, we were talking about Aminu Kanu, we were talking about uh, Enahoro, Antonio Enahoro. That my country has one of the best African dishes in Africa. We have what is also similar to the Spanish paella, we have what we call our fried rice. There are local traditional dishes, ceremonial dishes. In my own tribe, we have pounded yam and a goosey soup. We have eba, we have fufu, and we have a lot. But personally, I would recommend pounded yam. Nigerians are a very jovial set of people who, after work in the morning, in the afternoon, usually gather in family circles eat together and make jokes together. We also have what we call folk tales. Our parents, our grandfathers used to gather us and tell us stories, fictitious stories about tortoises, conquering nations, and we've always laughed over them. Nigerians, as Africans, have this peculiarity of being very respectful. We hold it very high that the younger ones must respect the elder ones. You know, this is practiced in different tribes in different forms. In my tribe, for example, if a child is going to greet the elder one, he has to prostrate, almost kneeling down. There are tribes like the Yorubas who the children must prostrate, kneeling, lie down to greet the elder ones. I mean, that's the very peculiar thing about Nigerians, respect. We hold it in high esteem. back and today's subject on the show is architecture. That's why we've invited Areti Marcopulu and Pau de Sola Morales, both architects. We've talked about housing, we've talked about materials, we've talked about designing, good and bad, and now it's time to talk about yourselves because it's time for the mystery question and it's time for Mark Roderick. Hello Hi. Mark, welcome How's back. How's it going? Yes. Not too bad. So, um, would you like to tell our guests how it works? Well, we have some um, devilish questions, I call them. A little bit strange and unusual, okay? So what you have to do is take one of the balls, put your hand inside, mix it around, take it out and hold it for a second and then you can open it. And then we'll start with Pau and then Areti and we'll see how you get and on. And Malcolm, okay? no? Ah, Malcolm as well. Do you, do you want to suffer? Do you want to suffer? Okay, okay no problem. So Pau, please? So, Shall I? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. They can be on a wide, ra ra oh. wide range of topics. Yeah. So don't uh, don't be shocked. The easy <laughs> ones are at the bottom. No, the easy ones are always at the top. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so okay, uh, Paul, would you like to start? Sure. Yes. Start with you. <coughs> don't worry, we don't get too private here. Mystery, okay. mystery. Yes. Well, devilish. I think it's a devilish bit too much. Devilish is better, no? Devilish is better. It's a bit like, too you know. much. Let's not scare them. <laughs> if you had to choose between going naked or having your thoughts appear in uh, in thought bubbles above your head for everyone to read, which would you choose? <laughs> I told you they were devilish. A yeah, bit they're like... devilish. I don't know what to say about this one. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, really. I, I think I, I could I could get get used to to being naked. naked. <laughs> <laughs> I, can see other... a I can see a thought bubble over your head now going, I hate this Irish guy. Why does he ask me this on television? No, naked is, <laughs> naked is, uh, is okay. Uh, I could get used to it. Uh, okay. The other would be... You're comfortable in your own worse. skin. Much worse, yeah. Good stuff. Areti. Okay. Okay, here we go. If you won the lottery, what whim would you indulge in? Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. Uh, but that's not very devilish, and it's it's very simple. I mean, I would uh, really um, indulge into more traveling okay. uh, and more traveling for pleasure and not for work. Okay. So um, where would your traveling for pleasure take you? <laughs> Which countries? I think it would uh, take me to South America. Okay. And it would also take me to um, Vietnam, Indonesia. Uh, Thailand. I've been there, but I would rather go back for for further uh, time to get to know people and cultures. 
Awesome. Mm, okay, excellent. sounds good. Might do that myself if I won the lottery. Malcolm, I didn't forget about you, but you know. You know, I'm not so confident as spousal, I'm a little bit scared. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Ta -da. Of all the people you've met lately, which one amazed you the most? So easy. Uh, <laughs> recently, I met Ohram Pamuk, the Literature uh -huh. Nobel Prize, so it was very, very interesting, and I mean, I'm so glad to meet him. Mm, okay. uh, where did you meet him? And what in, happened? Mexi How in Mexico. We were drinking tequila together. No, we were having dinner together. <laughs> and and it was, uh, it was like scout. two hours and a half conversation. It was very, very good. Wow. In Mexico. In Mexico. That wasn't a joke. That wasn't a joke. What were you it, doing in Mexico? Do you, because sorry, there's, yeah? there's a book. For, I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm an editor. I'm a publisher, and there's a book fair in Guadalajara, in Mexico. Ah, very nice. Mm. Okay. Okay. And you came back all in one piece. Yeah. Good stuff. Good I to know. So. Well, <laughs> I mean, Mark, have you noticed that maybe uh, Malcolm saw the question before? Sorry. I saw the question. Before I you opened, see? I opened the poll. Ah, yeah, no, I, you, were, you were quick onto it. I didn't see it. No, 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 I didn't well, see it. It's, anyway, it was, it was so no scared. problem. It was this so time scared. it's okay. Hmm? <laughs> it's okay for this time. Well, anyway, thank you guys for coming. Thank you so thank much, you uh, for and Malcolm, of course. Until next time, and Mark, see you in a bit. See you in a bit. With Matthew Tree, of course. The Casals Quartet is one of the most prestigious musical ensembles in the world, and in a few moments. They will be playing on our stage. This is the Weekly Mac. The great English playwright Noel Coward used to say once, the higher the buildings, the lower the morals. He was referring to London, but if we had asked him, I think he would say that this idea was true for all the major cities in the world. This statement contains a view of the city as something negative, and there is probably part of reason in it. However, big cities are also the places where the population has easier access to those services that guarantee, guarantee a survival. Big cities, yes or no? That is the question of our face-off today. And Patricia Scalona and Donna Katirnan are already here to make arguments in one direction or the other. Hello, guys. Hello. Patricia. Hi. Donica, welcome. How are you doing? Good morning. So, Patricia, you're in favor of mega cities. Why is that? Um, because I've been to many of them. In, because it's a reality we cannot deny anymore. So we better face it and just, you know, live with it. Um, I've lived in New York. I've lived on and off in London. I've been to Seoul, I've been to Mexico City, mm -hmm. and life is not as bad as the bleak future that we saw in Blade Runner, for example, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which is what we think of many times when, you know, because of this quote that you just read and, um, and the films that we've seen, we think of big cities, mega cities, right? Um, mega as cities. horrible places to live in, so. Mm -hmm. Donica, I'm well, sure you don't agree. First of all, yeah, let's let's hop on that terminology there. Mega city means a certain thing. I think the definition is roughly in excess of a seven million population. Mm -hmm. So now, yeah, New York qualifies, and I love New York. Very hard not to lo love New York, but there's realities there that you're not acknowledging, particularly when you get to countries that are gravitating entirely towards mega cities purposefully, such as I mean, such as China. For example, They're, they've had a megacity project going since the 1960s, which is now only massively coming to fruition. New York grew that way as a cultural hub naturally, as did London, did London whereas China is purposefully establishing these cities. Um, I'll give you an example now roughly what we're talking about, even just in terms of harm to human life, these cities are massively polluted, right? There's a, a measurement known as a PM 2.5, which is basically the amount of pollution per uh, cubic meter, right? Like, uh, it's directly very hazardous to health. So you pick a, w so there was a study done, 10 most polluted uh, cities in America versus 10 most polluted cities in China, right? Most polluted city in America, Bakersfield, California, right? Um, it had, I think, I think about 10.2 uh, on this scale. And it's not, smaller city by comparison, but quite, still quite polluted. Then you have Zhengtai in China. This is a city so big, it's 12,000 square kilometers. To give you an example of uh, how big that is, Los Angeles is about, is about uh, 1,300 square kilometers, right? Mm -hmm. It's got a, a, and 
So Bakersfield, most polluted city, 10.2 on that scale. This city, 155.8. Mm -hmm. This is a city that is hazardous for people's health to live in, in terms of eczema, lung cancer, things like it's ju ju So just on that very level, mega cities, not a good future. Something we would do very well to purposefully avoid on all, well, at all costs. Well, I'm quite impressed with Donica. You really did your homework today. I did my homework today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so sustainability, pollution is a big issue, actually. It's a big issue, yeah. But there are other mega cities that are working exactly on the opposite direction, like Tokyo, which also grew organically. Yeah, and true. by to 2030, it's going to be the biggest mega city in the world with 50 million people living in it. How many, sorry? 50 million people. Wow. Um, and also Hong, uh, Hong Kong as well. You know, there are they, cities, mega cities, which are working in a more, a less bleak future. Um, and um, they're working on, on sustainable uh, buildings, which mm. are going to be able like to grow um, vertically uh, in a way that, you know, will allow their residents to have gardens in them or to the buildings will be able to sustain themselves. Yes. Um, so and I think that's really of, interesting. Um, cars as well, no? The electric cars are coming hopefully soon enough. So it will improve a lot. But these are, these are very conscientious efforts by, again, as you pointed out, cities that grew organically. But I'm talking about the movement to like purposefully build towards mega cities, which is also, by by the way, decimating rural life. I mean, for like that that has happened in many ways organically. Like you could say, right? Henry Ford invented the automobile, mm -hmm. right? That's that's the truth of the matter. But there are many other truths at play. Like for example, when he invented the automobile, he also completely changed the way cities were constructed, thus kind of birth, birthing the massive city and decimated rural life in America. He did like that. He did that at the same time. That was like a kind of an offshoot effect. Whereas there's something rather immoral about that project as as, as it goes on, just to purposefully move all people into the cities. Like it's killed millions of people. Well, Again, China in China, not, in the 1960s, China when this China is not known for its. Like, it does It's a country that doesn't worry that much. It's the about largest human economic rights. power in the world. I know, I know, but, but I'm not saying that. I'm saying that it doesn't worry that much about human rights or um, the way their uh, citizens live. What I'm saying is that it's a future we cannot deny anymore. I mean, it's mm -hmm. true that there are places where it's doing it, they're doing it wrong, mm -hmm. but it's um, something that has those policies in China were created because they were observing how other mega cities were working in the world, and they decided at some point that it was the best way to have a large mass of population uh, live in a more, you know, controlled environment or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is. Mega cities are a reality, and the only thing that we well, can do. We should do try to avoid. But I uh, Donica, so. I take it that you uh, prefer living in the countryside. Where do you live at the moment? In Barcelona oh, or in a village? Well, I live in Barcelona, but I would not classify Barcelona as a mega city. Half of the building looks like plants. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I, you can see that when you, I'm not going to say a mega city is something where you can see the hills on one side and the the, the, the sea on the other. Let's be real about it. All right, mm -hmm. mega mm -hmm. cities. You're talking. Fritz Lang's metropolis, yes, Blade Runner, Guangzhou in China, cities for miles and miles and miles, um, just, uh, concrete metropolis is that kind of crack. And no, I don't like. I, I don't like it. I'm not a fan of it. Um, I'm, I'm actually a fan and a big believer of um, historical and mythical archetypes, for example. And going back millennia, you'll find, like, I mean, in the Bible and before it, like, just examples that are just built into the human consciousness. That yeah, as your man Noel Coward said. Uh, immorality lies in the city. You can have uh, in the Bible, for example, uh, the the Tower of Babel, or you got Sodom and Gomorrah. But then you move beyond that. Are you, you got like the Bible, really, to make your argument. Well, it's an archetype. <laughs> you, don't believe it, you, you don't believe in archetypes. I don't believe in the Bible, but whatever. Well, it, is, well, it <laughs> okay. exists and it's so old that nobody knows who wrote it. And beyond mm. that, you got Roman myths like the town mouse and the country mouse. What I'm saying is these are archetypes that existed before people knew how to write history. Mm -hmm. And there's something intuitive in people that says that, yeah, once you go into the city, then, the, then humans lose their touch with the earth itself, 
and that's where morality lies. Like work and on all the while they okay. were fighting about for Jerusalem, which was a mega city by its you know own right at that point. In, that's not in the know, Bible, in the though. That's that's that's, that's, a, that's not in the Bible. That's in the Crusades. That's no, a different that's thing. In the, no, that's a different things. But they were reading something in a book that you know they were bringing to reality afterwards. I didn't tell them how to <laughs> interpret the Bible, and I'm not into, I'm not saying the Bible's true. I'm saying it's a very ancient text mm -hmm. that from which you can glean archetypes like any ancient okay, text. Okay, I think we got that. What about the cost of living? Of because I, th I think... I mean, you can't deny that in the countryside or in a small place, the cost of living is not as high as in a city or mega city in this case. Well, it depends actually. It depends on the neighborhoods in, hmm. in uh, mega cities. For example, New York. Um, it was cheaper for me to buy... I smoke, sadly. But <laughs> it was cheaper for me to buy cigarettes in Brooklyn than it was in Manhattan. So that, that happened. That actually, you, you, they can change the prices of cigarettes because of the taxes and everything. So it depends on which part of the city you live. It's going to be cheaper for you to live in than other parts of the, yes. the city. city. But we mean the uh, yeah. within the city, like not only a, the state, which like is it was a weird, sorry, like a village. If we're talking about a, live, a village or a small place in the countryside, if things are done right, it's supposed to be more. Um, it's supposed to be cheaper, actually. It's supposed to, you know, we can take advantage of all the services, mm -hmm. and we can take advantage of all the, yeah. All the no, come on. Yeah. You're telling me it's cheaper. It's cheaper to live it in a city. Be. No, it should be. That's why the population the of Terrassa is booming right now, is because it's cheaper to live in the bigger city. No, come no, on, it should come be. Come off it. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> it should be cheaper. I mean, things were done properly uh, with the growth of mega cities. It's a big it's if. To be, it's to be, yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. But um, it should be it should be cheaper and it should be easier for you to live. I got one more major point to make that I, I would think. Like, oh, I right, when's the last like when's the last time you spent some serious time in the countryside? When's the last time? Like outside of a city, mm -hmm. outside of now specifically, I'm going towards the zone of light pollution. When's the last time you spent some time away mm, from light September? pollution? September. Mm -hmm. Huh? September. September. Now, when you get out into the country, mm -hmm. right? Is there not something just a bit profound, and I know you're cynical, Patricia, but a bit profound Very. about staring at the night sky and noticing the Milky Way and just feeling how fucking small you are in the universe, right? Well, that's that's small. I'm, I'm surrounded by skyscrapers. So Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> you can not, quite, not, not quite as because that's man constructed. We can we can comprehend that. We can't comprehend mm. it. We can't comprehend the universe. We can't have an idea of just how small we are. We, like while we're living in the city, that like I mean, there's a, an offset of that, uh, an offset effect of that, like mm -hmm. which you, know, you could say implies human arrogance. But I'm saying like, yeah, live all our lives in city, and you'll never be able to contemplate that. That's really getting away from okay, something crucial. Okay, I think time's up. Yeah. Anyway, just to sum up, Donica, give me three uh, advantages of living in the countryside. Okay, right. You can get touch with the earth, therefore Mother Nature, much healthier for your body at large. And, uh, well, I don't know, I mean, you don't have to listen to Patricia, that'd be another. You know. <laughs> I'll find well, it I'm wherever sure you are. The last one. <laughs> but this year it's your turn. Um, few advantages, I mean, the social life, the um, advantages of uh, being surrounded by culture and different cultures, um, and sustainability hopefully, in the future. That's mm -hmm. a buzzword okay. if ever I heard one. Well, thank you both very much. Very convincing, uh, both of you. See you next time. Okay. We're having a break now, and we leave you with a quote from one of the greatest architects ever, German-American Mies van der Rohe. He led the modernism movement in architecture, and his designs are still admired worldwide. We'll be back in three minutes, and don't go away. love music here at the Weekly Mag and especially when it's performed by first-class musicians. Like our next guests, they all belong to one of the most prestigious string quartets of the moment, the Casals Quartet. Welcome to the Weekly Mag. Thank it's you. a pleasure to have you here. And first of all, I would like to invite you to introduce yourselves. Okay. I'm so we start clockwise, yeah? Okay. So I'm Abel Tomas and I'm a member of the Quartet Casals. I'm a violin player. 
Okay, great. <laughs> Abel, yes? I'm Vera Martinez Menor. I also play the violin in the Quarteto Casals. Okay, Vera, welcome. I'm Jonathan Brown. I play the viola in Quarteto Casals. Okay, Jonathan, welcome. I am Arnaud Tomas. I'm the cellist of the group. Excellent. All right, so um, after the presentations, I'd like to ask you, you're from different places. I think the, your brothers and you're from Barcelona, that is from Madrid and you're from Chicago. So how was the quartet born? How was it created? Well, should I? Yeah. We all met in 1997. Back then, we were, um, the three of us, we were studying in the music school in Madrid, uh, Escuela Reina Sofia. Yes. And that's where we met and we started actually playing quartet with another violist. Jonathan joined us a couple of years later. And we met him in Germany, while we were studying in Germany. All right, okay. And now you're all based in Barcelona, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. What about the name of the quartet? Oh, well, that's better Arnaud explains. <laughs> it's a cellist, it's a group. Well, it's quite obvious actually. We wanted to make just a, a kind of reference to the great cellist Pau, Pau Casals. Yeah? And it's um, which we admire a lot as a musician, as a human being from the past. And it's a good name that everybody in the when we play abroad can recognize immediately. Of course. Of course, Casals, it is because he was a legend, of course. And that's why we chose this name, actually, considering the maybe the best string player of the, the 20th century that we had. Mm -hmm. Actually, in some concerts, you end up playing Alcandal Zuselis, no? The Song of the Birds, which was uh, Pau Casals' uh, homage to Catalonia. Exactly. Mm? Yeah, he used to play this song when he was exiled yeah, in, uh, in Franco's times, of course, very long time. So he was living in Prat in France, and then he played this song very often after his concerts. Yes. To remember a little bit his country, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, to celebrate your 20th anniversary, you started a tour in which you combined Beethoven and more contemporary composers. So why that mixture? I mean, the main project was, of course, to do all this Beethoven cycle. Yes. Which is uh, one of the most difficult things to play for a string quartet, a professional string quartet. I mean, especially to play all of them in one season that we did. And then we had the idea to add this uh, contemporary music just to make kind of confrontation and contrast. And also remembering that actually when Beethoven wrote these quartets for the society in this moment was also something so contemporary and so surprising from what they were used to listen until then, that we considered that it would be nice also to do again the same effect. So that, that an audience of nowadays, of course, everybody loves Beethoven already a lot, but also to, that they try to understand also new languages of mm. music. Okay, what is the most important project you're working on at the moment? At the moment, the most important project we have is the recording of the complete Beethoven quartets. Yes. Um, we're still in the process of, of, of recording, which means many long days in the recording studio. Um, there are three different box sets. Um, one, each will be released um, each year, 2018, 19 and 20, culminating in the 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth. Oh, so that's good. It's, it's a huge project to record all 17 quartets and for us it also means a huge responsibility because this is the document that will leave for the future of how we, how we um, hear and imagine and feel this, this music. Mm -hmm. Okay, in these 21 years you've been together, you've traveled a lot. Actually, you were saying before you travel like almost half of the year you're, Away. you're on the plane now. <laughs> you've been all over the world. Do you remember any anecdotes or any curious experiences you might have had in these 21 years? There, there are so many. It's hard to, it's hard to, it's hard to know it's what hard to, choose, to, just to, a to few. choose just a few. I mean, um, what's most interesting is how, how we adapt to situations that you think would be impossible. I remember once, um, years ago, we played in Galicia and there was confusion as the order of the program. Mm. And, and um, the three of us started one piece and are now realized just before he played the first note that he, was, he had started a different piece. We, had, we didn't know which piece we were playing, but very quickly I now um, um, realized what was happening and played the entire first movement from memory, no problem, and we went on. So there are always these situations that you know, things happen that we don't expect, but somehow, somehow we have to make do and, and, and carry on. Mm -hmm. It's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Other one is that in Istanbul I got chicken pox, suddenly from my son. Oh. <laughs> and I had, to, I had to play with fever and um, my red face, completely red. Uh, but anyway, I had to play. 
Yeah. So to play this concert. Okay. The string quartet is a prestigious form and it represents the true test of a composer's art. Why is that? I think um, Western music is basically, uh, can be uh, boiled down to four different voices. Even the most complicated symphonic or operatic works are, are, can be reduced to four, four simple voices. That's sort of how um, our music has been constructed for the last few hundred years. And so when you have a string quartet, you have the essence of this four voice texture. Um, but you don't have any of the distractions of different instrument, in, instrumentation, of different singers, of the huge forces of a symphonic work, or the virtuosity of a, a single pianist. You have four, four people, each representing a different voice. And I think for a composer, I imagine there's partly the feeling that there's, there's nothing to hide behind. There's the, the, the only thing he or she has is, the, is his or her own um, imagination and invention of, uh, for how to use these four voices. Uh, you are invited to perform in the world's most prestigious venues. Uh, I'll just mention a few, Carnegie Hall in New York, um, the Philharmonic of uh, Berlin, um, Cité de la Musique in Paris. Which one do you like or have you liked best and why? When uh, have you felt that you clicked most with the audience? Mm -hmm. I think the, the biggest connection we usually feel is actually here in Barcelona because we know so many people that come to the audience okay, and their students the and family. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> it's good, it's good. It's good. Um, in order of which halls we like best, I think each of us have, have different opinions here. They're all amazing, amazing halls. Whitmore Hall has a great acoustic. Amsterdam Concertgebouw is also absolutely great. And, uh, and the click always is different depending on, on which audience we're performing that moment. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, and a uh, curiosity I've always wanted to ask uh, violinists about the Stradivarius violin, very famous in the whole world, for um, uh, untrained years. Okay, uh, like myself, for example, I couldn't distinguish a Stradivarius sound from a normal violin sound. What would be the difference? Well, Stradivari, let's say, is the most famous, and everybody in the street knows, ah, Stradivari, when, you, when they see somebody see a violin in the airport for the policeman, for example, he asks, ah, it's a Stradivari. It's kind of the, 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 the stamp, no? Um, but it was not only the greatest, it w was maybe the most famous, but on, on that period in Cremona, also, the Jesu are great uh, instruments. Uh, Guarneri the Jesu or, or other, other many uh, violin makers. Um, I would say that Stadibari was the first one who um, made a, a standard dimensions on how to build a violin and also cello or viola at many, 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 le for, the, le for later, for, for like, like the violin I played, this modern violin, it's also based on a Stradivari model. So it was like the stand, it became the standard um, portions of an uh, in, uh, in instrument. Okay. Yeah, let's mm -hmm. say. And uh, the projection, especially the projection of, I see. of his instruments. Well, and whenever we have great musicians on the set, like today, we like to ask them uh, to show us some, uh, you know, some musical concepts, basic musical concepts. And I'd like to ask you, uh, if it's okay with you, what is a pizzicato? It's something we couldn't ask a piano player, <laughs> is that right? Yeah, piano player plays always pizzicato, let's yeah. say more or less. A pizzicato is when, instead of playing with the bow or notes, like this, that you can hold it very long and make a lot of resonance. Also, with pizzicato is just, you have this, like a guitar. No? I see. That is a pizzicato sound. Okay. Only with the finger, direct to the string, and that's it, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. What is the, the difference between minor and major keys? So, basically, um, there are different ways that have been established to, to um, define the space between two similar notes. So if we have a sol and a sol, we can divide these notes along the lines of a major scale, which would be... Or a minor scale with a closer third. So the major scale has normally been associated with confirmation, resolution, um, a certain um, positive, joyful feeling. And the minor scale um, normally 
with doubt and a certain degree of anxiety and a certain um, sadness, so to speak. And this it becomes even more evident when we all play together. If we all play one sol mayor, one one okay. major, one major chord. Uh, And then you hear the minor chord to hear the difference. And so it becomes very evident that the emotional um, meaning of these different, of different, these different scales. Mm -hmm. That sounded uh, amazing. And to end with, uh, let's see, what is a chord and how many types of chords are there? So a chord basically just means um, a number of different notes played at the same time. So um, one of the great things about the musical language is that there, in the end there's an infinite number of combination, combinations of notes. So there's no limit on how many chords there can be. Now there are certain chords, like the ones that we just played, which are um, especially familiar to us. So if we play a major chord, this is one type of chord of, of different notes played at the same time. Starting with a fundamental note. Uh, and then I add another note. And that chord needs to resolve. So basically, a chord is simply a collection of notes that are played at the same time that have um, certain tendencies, let's say. So the first chord we played, just to play it again so everyone hears, the. to resolve and so what composers do is they play with our expectations of, of, of these chords and and use them to, to unite larger um, larger phrases such that we, 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 we understand the the story or the emotional um, voyage let's say that a piece represents mm -hmm. well I would say that was a great uh, music lesson thank you for that <laughs> <My pleasure. laughs> And um, today you're going to, to play for us as well. What are you going to play? We're Have you going decided? to play the Presto, second movement of a string quartet by Beethoven. And concretes the Opus 130, which has uh, six movements. And this is a very short one, I think, can represent a little bit mm -hmm. our quartet. Excellent. <laughs> All right, and before we go, when can we come and see you here in Catalonia? Well, we will be performing on 9th, February 9th, here in Barcelona, in the Auditorio. Mm -hmm. And abroad, we have the US tour coming up at the end of this month, and we are going also to Asia after the summer, I think, and many other countries. Okay. Well, we can't uh, come and see you in the US or Asia, but uh, certainly we'll come but to see Barcelona. you in uh, Barcelona. Thank you all for coming. It's Thank been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you for inviting you. us. The Gazals Quartet are getting ready to perform live on our stage and we are going to take the opportunity to review some idioms related to architecture. House of Cards, a bridge too far, a fence sitter, well, Becca Bardaka comments on these and some other idioms. Check it out. Hi guys, today's topic is architecture and buildings. Now, we have an expression in English that goes, every man is the architect of his own fortune, which means that every person is responsible for their own destiny. Now, of course, some people, like Marxists, would disagree with that saying, and they'd say that it's all just a house of cards, which is something that could really easily collapse or fail. I personally am on the fence about topics like that, like politics, for example, which means I can see both sides of the argument and I tend to be on the fence because I don't like people coming down on me like a ton of bricks which means that they can really easily attack or punish me. Now of course political decisions don't tend to happen publicly they usually happen behind closed doors so that's something that drives me up the wall it makes me really mad and irritated and angry. Of course, politicians also usually try to introduce things by the back door, which means to introduce something in secret. 
And then, of course, people usually discover this because of the internet, for example. And then politicians try to bridge the gap, which is to fix these differences. At the end of the day, though, it's all just water under the bridge, which means that it's something that's past, finished, forgotten, just like I'm going to go now. OK, guys, that's it. Thank you. Bye. My brother has made a great discovery to start the season. The experts who live here don't like Catalan houses. In a few moments, you'll know why. Seven years ago, American Chloe Phillips uh, visited Catalonia as an exchange student. She stayed in Villanova y la Geltru for one year, where she fell in love with the country, its language and its culture. Years later, in Washington, she met a TV Catalan crew and she was invited to come back to Catalonia, where she is currently uh, developing her career as a singer. And we've been with her in Villanova and shared also a few moments with the family which welcomed her years ago when she was a teenager. This is her portrait. Enjoy it. My name is Chloe Phillips and I'm a singer-songwriter. I first came to Catalonia when I was 16 on a student exchange program getting placed with a family in Villanova. When I first came here, I stayed here for 10 months. And after that, I went to university in Washington, D.C. at Georgetown. In the town I can't forget. University in America is very expensive. Um, so I try to take advantage of as many events as possible to get food and things like that because my school costs, without scholarship, it's like over $70,000 a year. The Spanish department was having a fest, uh, a party for La Diada de San Jordi and I was actually about to leave. I was at the door when all of a sudden this TV crew comes. It was like five people or six people in this TV crew and I was like, what is this? And this really tall blonde guy, <laughs> Haldor. And I was like, what is this crew doing here? So I decided to stick around and see what they were doing. And they ended up filming me as well. And as a result of getting to be on this show, now I'm back here in Catalonia and I've gotten to record this song that I wrote when I was 18 called Barcelona. And I just feel really, really, really lucky, <laughs> like extremely lucky. I felt like I wouldn't be right to have a song about Barcelona without speaking Catalan. <laughs> Just because it's such, a, I feel like, an important part of the city, the language. People are usually surprised that I speak Catalan because I think a lot of people come here um, from other parts of Spain or Europe or Latin America and just learn Spanish and they can get by with Spanish so they don't bother to learn Catalan because it is a hard language to learn and it, it is a lot of effort so I feel like it's added a lot to my life. Barcelona in the morn, all the people in cafe. I've spent so many years um, writing songs and trying to get some traction and in Los Angeles I went there with the idea of doing music but of course there's so many people there who want to do music and it's so expensive and it's really easy to get discouraged and you end up spending most of your time just like working to make a living and um, it was always a dream that I had and it's always been something that I've done and it's something I'm gonna do no matter what because music is just like what I do. I think when you have an opportunity to do something, you just take it. And I've gotten that opportunity here, um, so I'm just rolling with it. That's the main reason why I feel so happy here and so at home is because of the people that have welcomed me and made me feel like I'm like just another Catalan person.
back and ready to offer you the latest language tips of the show with Tim Guinea from International House Barcelona who will explain you the differences between the phrasal verbs uh, build in, build up or build on. Enjoy! Today we're talking about architecture and when I think about architecture I think about buildings and, and beautiful houses. And if we think of phrasal verbs, well, we normally use the verb build. So the first one is build in. And if we build in something, we incorporate it into the design or the plan. So I'm building a new house and I want to make sure I include a bathroom, so I build it into my plans. We also have build on. And build on is when you extend or make bigger. So think you want to add another level to your house or apartment, well, you build on top. The opposite of building on is to tear down. That means you want to take it away, that there's nothing left. It's not something you want to do very quickly. You want to think it over. So you want to take your time to make a decision, make sure you're making the right decision. And of course, when we're building a house, there are a lot of things we need to factor in. And if we factor in something, we take it into consideration. So you want to factor in where are your windows going to go? Where are you going to put the door? Where do you need to put pipes and other utilities? They're all things that you need to figure out, which is kind of like to solve. You're thinking of a mathematical problem and you probably will have to do a lot of mathematical problems if you're going to build a house. And you want to make sure that all your angles, well, that they line up, that you have your walls matching your ceilings and everything is nice and straight. Otherwise, you might not have a house at all. Well, that's it from me. And until next time, I'll see you. Architectural styles are a kind of skin for cities and towns. They're the first thing you see as soon as you arrive in a country and therefore it is the first thing that can surprise you in a positive or negative way. We will see uh, what our two official comparison makers thought of Catalan architecture. Matthew Tree and Mark Roderick, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So tell me, um, what was the first thing you thought when you saw Gaudí's work? Well, I was, in fact, it, my reaction was the same as all the foreign friends who see those buildings, the, especially the, the three famous Gaudi buildings in Barcelona, yes. two on the Passage de Gracia and then the Sagrada Familia. It's just they're, they're blown away by it. 
and I remember one friend, actually he's an ex-friend now, um, <laughs> but he, we were walking past the Casa Bayor, which is the coloured Gaudi building, Gaudi building one, on the Passage yes. de Gracia, and he was just, all buildings should be like that. I mean, he was so knocked out. And then he said, in England, they would never do that. They would never allow something like that to be built with all the curves and the colors and the, the symbolism as well. They, they'd just never allow it. You know, it would be banned. That's what he said. And I, I suspect he was right. Yeah. Mark. Um, I have to agree with Were you blown away by Gaudi as well? I the was. First time you I, saw I was work? blown away by the fact that uh, they spent so much time building these things. Also, the curve thing was, uh, I, I think the reason we wouldn't have it in Ireland and, and, and maybe uh, England as well is, I don't know, the weather. I don't know, would it react well to the weather, all the rain and that? I don't, I don't know, I don't know. But I'm sure that I was blown away by the Batalio, the other one. But the Sagrada Familia, what I don't understand is why they haven't got it finished, basically. Is like for all the great architecture that they have, something that still blows my mind is like, wow, there are still 120 years or whatever it is later, they're still building it. That's dedication. I've, I don't know if it's true, but I've heard, I don't know if, if, mm -hmm. if you've heard this as well, but uh, it's because Gaudi and his will mm -hmm. said that it could never be built by public money. It had to be private donations. contributions from donations from the citizens. Yeah, this uh, is what I heard. This, I mean, I think it's a fact. Because it was part of his symbolic thinking that it had to be a genuinely popular building where the citizens alone contributed to doing it. No administration, no government, no state. Okay, I didn't, I didn't yeah. know that. It was always a question I had, like, why are they still building that thing? You know, like, it should have yeah. been built years well, ago. Well, that's what, that's what I've heard, but I don't know if that's absolutely I think it's true. Is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, obviously, uh, not all citizens live in uh, Gaudi houses or modernist no. uh, buildings. Uh, most people live in normal uh, flats or normal houses. In your survey, uh, Mark, yes. where have you been? And what do expats uh, think of uh, Catalan uh, buildings? We went to uh, Hospitalet del Llobregat and uh, we asked about like the difference basically between places, well, the, we're here, here and there, no? Where people live there and where people live here. And yes. you'll see that it's quite interesting, the answers. And I agree with a lot of them, actually, as you will see from the video. There's okay. a couple of interesting things there. Let's watch uh, Mark's first survey and then we'll uh, comment on it. Welcome to Hospitalet del Llobregat, home of some of the most visually stunning skyscrapers in Catalonia, as you can see here behind me. And these over here. I bought some tools with me to make some slight changes. I think they could do with some sort of an upgrade. Is there any difference between the houses here and the houses in Finland? They're not so light built, like, like here. <laughs> yeah, here if it rains, the water comes yeah, straight yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Peru, we we have uh, earthquakes. The walls here are thinner. You can um, hear all the conversations next to the other apartment. Everything. Everything. They're very small here, and um, in Colombia we do have a lot of space, so much bigger. The houses in London are houses. Here, they're flat. I actually, it's, it's a really weird thing to say, but I found Barcelona quite claustrophobic because everything does that. You kind of got to do this to see the sky, whereas in London, we may not get sunshine that often, but everything is here. Okay. So the sky just seems to be there all the time. Okay. Great survey, uh, Mark. Yes. Mm, congratulations. Uh, it was also to see the difference, and I agree with I agree with a lot of them. The difference uh, with the space. The girl at the end talks about like here, like in Barcelona, like everything is so small, little boxed up, high, etc. When you go to England and, and Ireland, I suppose everything is a little bit lower. It's like we drop down a couple of levels. I suppose as well for the rain, the wind, etc., or the laziness of like, come on, lads, we're not going to build a fourth floor, are we? No, no, we'll leave it at three. Let's go to the pub. <laughs> Let's go to the pub, of course. Well, obviously not uh, everything in Catalonia is modernism, Matthew. No, um, and it's, actually, it's, it's very sad, really, but because there was a 39-year dictatorship under which a lot of modern building was done, mm. and because it was a dictatorship, it meant that corners could be cut, backhanders could be paid without any problems at all. They rounded out the corners, no? They rounded out the corners. <laughs> Mayors, uh, 
you know, with, you just had to slip a sum of money to the local mayor and he would allow you to build in a place which, you know, shouldn't be built. In Barcelona, they took those down, but in Barcelona, some of the most beautiful modernist buildings just had these hideous 60s apartments built on top of them. And it was Mayor Pascual Maragall back in the 80s and 90s insisted on these being uh, taken Locked. down again. I mean, it was... But and they, it's a horrible thing, especially also outside Barcelona in the villages that you can, like Banyolas, for example, <laughs> where you can walk into what is obviously a medieval square and one side of it is all these beautiful old buildings and it's just like being in the 30th, 13th century. And then you turn around and there's a monstrosity sitting in front of you that's sort of jerry-built, a real eyesore, and you really want to know where the architect lives, you know, so you can <laughs> Hunt him express down. your opinions <laughs> to him, you know. And I mean, this. that doesn't happen in the UK? Yeah, it, even, yeah, and there was no dictatorship, so there's no excuse for <laughs> it. Zero excuse. In the 60s, especially, this is something that's famous and was talked about quite a lot in, <clears throat> in England, especially. In the 60s, there was a huge building boom. There was a lot of money, the economy was going well, so there was a lot of building. And they destroyed, uh, for example, in Liverpool, they knocked down some beautiful Victorian buildings and built one of the ugliest shopping centres in Great Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, and they did this all over the country, in fact. You know, ugly shopping centres, ugly high-rise blocks, some of them very badly built. There were a couple of serious tragedies back in the 60s. And so, yeah, there too you get the, the combination. Yeah, it's a you know. shame. It's a real shame. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, Mark, something I really like about Ireland yes. is the stone walls. It's beautiful. Do you agree yeah, with me? A little yeah. bit more rural. Yeah, it's beautiful. If you ever have an aerial shot of, of Ireland, like we don't have, obviously, the Pedrera Sagrada Familia or any of these massive shopping centres that England have, we do have these beautiful stone walls that divide out every single piece of land belong to every single person. And they keep getting smaller and smaller and it becomes more visually stunning if you're standing on top of a mountain and looking out and you can see all of these it's like a puzzle it's like a giant puzzle yeah yeah, no? yeah. it's beautiful That's, it is it is it's nice and so they uh, were actually built to to uh to i don't know to show a person's property but some of them are so small yeah because what happens is is uh they divide up like for example we have a, a little piece of land my father inherited and uh it's, it's in the middle, it's surrounded by other peoples, but in order to divide it out, they go, okay, right, you gotta build a wall from here to here and here to here, and that's it. And they draw out the line and then you have to go and look for the stones. I remember going with my father to the quarry to pick up wow. and put up these big rocks of stone. I actually have stone walls outside of my house as well, but it's something very, we have a mountain range right beside where I live called the Burren, and it's a, one of the biggest limestone uh, mountain ranges in, in the world, I believe. So really? that's where we, that's why there's a lot of stone. This limestone is there. So Blue they cut limestone. it out. Yeah, they cut it out and we, we build it. So yeah, it's, uh, it's quite beautiful. And also you so talked So you actually uh, built one of these yeah. uh, walls yourself. Myself, I would love to my see father. Mark doing that. Myself, my yeah. father, and my grandfather built the wall in the front of our house. I remember it very clearly. In 1990, we did it, just before and, my grandfather and passed away. And so this away. is still going? On. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People I, still do this. Yeah. People still huh? do it. Stonewall, it's, I think it's to make the architecture kind of become part of the land, do you understand? Mm. And even the small villages, they have really lots of color in the small villages in Ireland. Like they, w they have blues and yellows and the colors on the houses. It's wow. to lighten up the fact that it's gray and, and, and raining all the time. So everything is kind of dotted with colors. And then you have these, these, these kind of like walls everywhere. So mm -hmm. it gives it a rural feel. Another feature of houses mm. in Ireland is the fact they are really, uh, the they are waterproof, no? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, compared oh, to here, what would you say? I don't know how many houses I've been in here. And as soon as it starts raining, after 10 minutes, there's a drip coming from somewhere. Like, it's like they build beach houses everywhere. In <laughs> Ireland, obviously, you have to put three layers of like what they call this black like PVC between the walls and the and the thing. So yeah, the, here they, they're not prepared for the rain. Okay, what about your second survey? The second survey, well, I wanted to see which iconic buildings people would bring to Hospitalet. Obviously, they had these beautiful buildings, as you saw. So which iconic building, like, I don't know, the Taj Mahal or, you know, Matthew's house, things like this, you know, iconic place to bring it to, <laughs> to attract more people to the, to the city. Good question. <laughs> Yeah. Let's see what people answer. Okay. If you could bring any building from the world, which building would you bring to Hospitalet? Perhaps the Tal Mahal. Maybe the Colosseum. La Pedrera. So you would rob the Pedrera from Barcelona and bring it to Hospitalet? Yeah. 
la Sagrada Familia, why not? I love Big Ben, I love Big Ben. Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower. Another phallic structure in the middle of, <laughs> of uh, yeah. hospitalized. It's in Dubai. The, the Burj Khalifa. Exactly. Bring in the blessing. <laughs> what, what is the blessing? Blessing, blessing is everything. You know, no bring the Taj Mahal come here, no like the Alpha Tower through here, not like they bring the again like the World Trade Center again, again, again. You know, okay. yes. So you would bring you would bring peace and love and no buildings. No building, respect in the people, love in the people, respect in the human. Human life is one time coming. Do you know who Toyo Ito is? Ito es. Toyo Ito. Ito es? What's this? Toyito. Toy Toyo Ito? Toyo Ito. Toyo Ito. I think he's the, the builder of the hotel. Yeah. Well done, well done. This one and just right here. And also the, the, the designer of this building. I think he's an architect, maybe? The architect who brought this hotel. Well done! Because we live in this hotel. <laughs> yes, the, the red one. Yeah, he won a, uh, an award. He should change the color. This is not that fun. Blue, I like blue. I right, blue. Would you change anything of this building? No, it's nice. It's okay? Maybe the color, because I don't like red. What color would you change it to? Pink, why pink? Because we, it would be very touristic. <laughs> That's it. Yeah? Awesome. Go and have lunch. Okay, so what's the name of the architect again? Toyo Ito. Mm -hmm. It was kind of funny. It's like small toy, Toyo Ito. Yes. <laughs> it's actually, people the, got the, confused. People, the people repeating it sounded a little bit like they were trying to do imitations of Japanese speakers. Yeah. It was a bit dodgy. <laughs> Toyo Ito. Well, actually, we are talking of a really, really prestigious architect, yes. a Japanese mm -hmm. architect. Yes. And I think he won a really, really important award mm -hmm. for these buildings. He did, yeah. Like the, the maximum award, award yeah. in architecture, the Pritzker. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway, so you went to L'Hospitalet in, in uh, Europe Square, Plaza Europa. That's right, no? Plaza Europa, exactly, where they have these, these two buildings as well. And we also passed by the other side of Hospitalet, which was uh, Belbice, which was yes. the other side of the, of the track. Okay, uh, let's talk about uh, houses, no? Mm -hmm. Houses, the Catalan houses. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's, uh, um, let's compare them to the English houses and uh, houses in um, Ireland. Well, I have a question for you. Actually, I have a question for you and for Matthew. Ah, okay. Just this is exactly comparing the, the, the houses in Ireland and the houses. You're looking at me very suspiciously. Mm. Well, yeah, Worry, furiously, what I'm going to ask you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I was thinking before the show. I was like, there's lots of things in an Irish house that we have a name for, and that you don't have here, and maybe you don't even have them in England. And I thought it was interesting. Do you know what a hot press is? Nope. Hot press. No. Hot press. Hot, hot press, press is a room in the house in Ireland, right, where they keep the, um, the, the heater for the water. Okay. And we also put clothes in there because the heat, you don't have to iron the clothes then because the heat keeps the clothes kind of like from creasing and you keep your towels in there and stuff like that. So we have a hot press. You don't have them here, do you? I don't think nope. so. And in England you don't have <laughs> nope, them either? Absolutely so not. So there you go. I, I discovered something we don't, we, that nobody else has. You know, it's like hanging okay. them up in the shower with the heat it's on. It's a good uh, Irish invention. There you go. It saves mm. you ironing. And then the other one was a back kitchen. No idea. No idea? Not in, you don't have a back kitchen in, in, no. in England? We have Strange. a kitchen. A back kitchen. You have a kitchen, yeah. You know, yeah. We, cook we, it, have, I mean. we have a back kitchen, right? So you have the kitchen, and then always in the side of the kitchen, you have a place where you have the washing machine, the dishwasher, a uh, place where you peel the potatoes, very important in Ireland. You have an actual place to so peel the potatoes. So you go to the back kitchen and to you go peel to the, back the kitchen potatoes. And you keep... Why oh, can't you do that okay. in the kitchen? I, I don't know. My father always, I always find... Because the dirt, the dirt, because we used to dig them out of the garden, mm -hmm. and it would get the dirt in the kitchen. Kitchen. So I guess the idea is the back kitchen is where you can get it yeah, all dirty yeah, and yeah. muddy and clean everything and then you bring it into the kitchen to cook it. But the, the side kit, the back kitchen thing, it just, it, Dutch houses have a thing called the side kitchen, the zy which is exactly the same thing. There you go. Mm -hmm. 
and, uh, yes. and with the same functions and everything, but not in England. They and don't where you have go that. to okay. peel the potatoes but and to everything. peel the potatoes, and usually <laughs> there's a sink in there for the heavy washing up and stuff like the that. The Dutch is chopping the tulips, no? They grab the tulips and chop them there, chop yeah, the yeah, cheese. Yeah, and then they eat the muck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, continue. Yeah. Let's continue. Yes. Let's talk about, I don't know, maybe Matthew wants to tell us some things which are different in the UK when it comes to housing oh, and houses. Oh, no, they're very obvious things. Like uh, here, in, here in Catalonia, at least, most people live in flats. Yes. That's the most normal. Uh, yeah. uh, and they rent, uh, they rent them, uh, they own them, or they, they try own and them. own them. Yes. Uh, I know many more people paying mortgage uh, mortgages than than are paying than are paying rent for their for their flats and in in England and London in particular it's people tend to live in houses that can be detached houses which means standalone houses or <coughs> terraced houses which means they're all in a row or semi-detached houses which means two houses joined together but they're separated from the next semi-detached house along which is okay. very really typical in the, especially in the suburban areas all these victorian houses no as and well. a little later as well like okay. uh, early 20th century right up to the 1930s a lot of these semi semi d's as they uh, call mm. them over there okay okay semi d's semi d's semi detached <laughs> houses all right so yeah it's true people living in um, in houses rather than in flats and people uh, renting rather, rather than, than buying. Uh, buying. And having yeah. a garden with grass to cut. Yeah. Something you don't have here. In a, I remember I used to spend my Saturday mornings cutting grass outside and all of my friends did. You guys don't have big gardens with grass to cut and stuff like that. Imagine in England you do as well, right? Like a or garden Or even area. little gardens. It's not a patio you know. or terrace, it's an actual garden. Yeah. Hmm. I miss that. Well, it's funny because the, the first Catalan president in the modern era, in the 20th century, Francis Massia, he said that what he would like to achieve for all Catalans, all, all the citizens, was uh, a house and a little garden. And uh, hey, in England, <laughs> you know, we already, they already had that. You're a real source of information, huh? Today yeah, you have yeah. pulled out two well, ones that I never knew. No, I'm just the, the, old. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, the age thing again, the age yes. issue is a big issue in um, all our shows. But anyway, in terms of price, price is also um, a big difference when it comes to housing in the UK and here in Catalonia, isn't it? <clears throat> London is the second city with the most expensive square meter in the whole world. It's um, an amazing 15,000 euros per square meter wow. in London, as opposed to 4,500 in uh, And we're Barcelona. talking average numbers, of course. Average, average figures. But in fact, I wow. know people now who live in areas of South London, for example, that 20, 30 years ago would have been very cheap areas to live in, and now they cost a fortune. Uh, so it seems to be spreading all over the, mm -hmm. the whole of the city, which is 7 okay. million people. And when it comes to uh, numbers here, what would be the difference? Well, the square the square meter in Barcelona is four thousand five hundred, so that's quite a lot less than the fifteen thousand euros of mm. uh, uh, London. And here also, it's it's interesting because the it depends very much on the area. I'm talking about Barcelona yes. specifically. Location, location, location. Exactly, because Barcelonans also have a kind of snobbish thing. You know, if you if you buy a flat in Nalbaris, which is a traditional working class area, then a lot of Barcelonans would say, mm, no, I prefer, you know, to live in the Eixample because it, it's, it's like a better address, that kind of thing. Another thing I found surprising was that in the villages and towns where you have old buildings, these would cost a fortune in Britain because these would be protected, you know, all the rest of it. Whereas here it's exactly the re reverse. If you go into a 13th century, you buy a 13th century house, as I did myself a few years ago, <laughs> uh, it's actually cheaper than smaller, uh, ultra-modern flats just around the corner. You said 13th century? Yeah. You bought a house, a 13th century house? A 13th house. century house, yeah. Really? Yeah, but it, with modern conditions, you know, <laughs> not living like a, a medieval peasant. You had an elevator peasant, inside, you know, but... uh, you know, a big American kitchen, no, something like this, or did you do many much re renovations inside it? No, very, no? very little, just had to strip away But we're away not talking about Barcelona here. here. No, no, we're talking again about Banyolas. Okay. Yeah. I was trying to get it into each other. Of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> of, of Pla de l'Estaine, yes. Canton. The town and the hall capital of, of the world, of, in fact, no, for you. 
Yes, uh, yeah, well, Dali always said it was uh, Perpignan, Perpignan, but um, exactly. no, no, I'm convinced it's... Okay. Have you, have you got a man cave there? A man cave? Yes, do you know what a man cave is? It's a shop with accessories for men, is that right? <laughs> it's a chain. <laughs> no, no, a man cave is a room in the house where the man would have his records, you know, he could live his, relive his youth again. Okay, you that's know. very sexist, no? It, it is a little bit. Sometimes sure. it's in a garage out the back in Canada. It's uh -huh. generally the back garage where the man, well, the man has his tools for the garden, his tools for the thing, and then he's got his records and his books and his, okay. you know, a little escape right. from and reality. And I, let me guess, this yes. is the subject of your next survey. Indeed it is, well done. Okay, how so well the, I know you. You no? do, no? you're getting to know me very well at the minute, yes. So <laughs> okay, the next one I asked people whether they had man caves or not. So mm. Okay, fun. let's find out. If you had a room in your house, like a basement or something, and you could convert it into anything you wanted to, what would you do? A sex palace. <laughs> Sorry, but I would. <laughs> I'm really can you, sorry. Can you describe what would be in there, please? Um, I don't know. Lots of padding, <laughs> lots of padding, and um, I, all the things that I've never tried, but think I might like to try, but I don't know what those are yet. Why the padding? Sorry, because, I'm curious. Because it's going to get really physical, isn't it? But it is. Come on, it's sex. It's going to get physical. So we need some padding so I don't hurt myself. A soccer field. A party place, also ladies. A good bed. Soccer field, a bed, and a place to have nice ladies. Exactly. So you can imagine <laughs> everything there. What would be in your perfect man cave? A golf simulator. A cinema? For me? Yeah. Okay. Just for you? Just for me, yeah. And maybe the family sometimes, yeah. Swimming pool. Swimming pool. Who would you bring to the swimming pool with you? <laughs> All my friends. A massive uh, office with a beautiful desk so I could work. That's kind of boring, no? Just like, would you, why would you want to work? Because work is something that everyone found, finds boring, but then if you make the area really nice with flowers and a nice window and like a place for tea and everything, then it's, you know, it's a pleasure to sit down and work. In the basement, I saw um, people that had a cocodrile there. You heard it right. He said a crocodile. He went to a house where it literally had a, a man had a man cave in the basement of the house. I think it was in uh, Illinois, if I'm not mistaken, Chicago. And he had a crocodile. In fact, he had two crocodiles in there. Instead of doggies, you have alligators. Yeah. Okay. But well, live, fair live alligators. I didn't want to go into too much detail because I was afraid of what he might tell me, you know, like yeah. dispose of bodies, I don't know, like something, <laughs> something he used it. They were extremely loyal pets. I don't know. Okay, before we finish, let's talk a little yep. bit about decoration, which okay. is something quite different in Catalonia from the UK and Ireland. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'd like to talk about carpets. Why do you guys have carpets everywhere? Yeah, we do. Mm. They gather a lot of dust and they're the source of a lot yeah, of chest me. pains. Yeah, I don't like carpets, not a fan at all. I okay. don't know why we have them. I imagine it's because of the heat to keep the room. What, what yeah. about you guys? No, we always. I've yeah, I've lived except when I lived in squats. I, that we always had carpet, wall to wall carpet. That means, you know. Okay, well it's cozy. Not at padding, least. you know, just Not padding. just wall to wall carpet. You, you didn't know, need which you padding. Walk up. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. No what comment. about these really uh, narrow and steep stairs that you have sometimes oh. in uh, houses? These like spiral stairs, the ones that's what mm. you mean. Sometimes they can be very narrow, very steep. Yeah, no? we, I actually have one in my house. My father built, my father actually builds the stairs. He's a carpenter. And uh, I, I've fallen down that stairs so many times. I mean, I've never fallen down stairs apart from in my own house. And it is true now that you pointed out. Getting up to my room, the stairs is like that, you know? And if you wear uh, socks, uh, for sure you're going to slip. And I've fallen down like I don't know how many times. I don't know why we have them at such a strange angle. It is, it is, we should have a little like this. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about plugs? Plugs? Mm -hmm. Plugs is another issue. You don't have plugs in, in bathrooms, for example. We have a different plug in the bathroom, it's true. We yeah. have the three-prong uh, plug in the rest of the house, but in the bathroom there's generally only one small plug at the side for a shaver, and it's usually up high, away from the, from the water. Do you have this in England, or do you have regular yeah, same, plugs? Same thing, yeah. exactly the same, yeah. Okay. To stop people getting and electrocuted. Fire, fire yeah. alarms. Fire alarms. I, I don't remember. Are they mandatory never, in all homes? I've never lived in a building in England that had a fire alarm. 
of a... We have fires in the house, so we don't actually, like we actually have, we have a range. Do you know what a range is? A range. A range. It's a mountain reason. range? No, no, no. A range is a, a huge metal structure. Uh, it's like a stove, a huge huh. stove oh, that okay. we build a fire inside the house and it heats the whole house. I see. And we have two fireplaces. Okay. So a fire alarm would be useless. Uh-huh. Because there's three fires going in the house. So we just yeah. have to control the fire, I suppose. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And to end with, what's been uh, like the, the weirdest house you've ever been in or you've lived in? That would be, without any doubt, my maternal grand, uh, grandmother's house, which was, I mean, she was, basically, she was living back in the 1920s. You know, she didn't have a fridge. She had, uh, the heating was like a stove that she had to change the ashes every day. And uh, also, I was convinced when I was a kid and I had to sleep there on my own that it was haunted. I, I, really? I saw, a, one, one night, I saw a ghost in the mirror and I was in the bed where my great-grandmother had died, her mother, and I was convinced that I, I saw this sort of human silhouette, white silhouette, in, in the mirror, and I couldn't sleep all night, and I kept looking, hoping it would go away, and it didn't. Uh, so that was the weirdest house I've ever been in. Do you yeah. realize oh that God, this, season, in this season you've, you've <laughs> seen UFOs and you've yeah. seen ghosts? I think we should have another show apart just for you. The Paranormal with Matthew Tree. <laughs> <laughs> you always yeah. have these amazing stories. Okay, Mark, it's your turn. The weirdest uh, place I have you've to, lived in. I have to agree. Like my gr my grandfather uh, grew up in a house in the middle of nowhere. It's quite similar, I suppose, to something like Matthew's. And I remember going there and staying uh, in the summer times. I used to help out on the farm when I was a child. And they had no running water, no electricity, and no phone. And this was in the 1990s, so it wasn't wow. that old. I mean, wow. it was okay. like the last uh, decade, not or the mm -hmm. two decades ago at this stage and yeah I guess that was uh, and it had that kind of feeling no like that there might be ghosts there or it's very mm. like, creaky and old and things like that uh, that would have been the strangest I guess and it has been fun indeed today as well thank Always. you Mark thank you Matthew for uh, joining us you. in this first episode of the third season mm? see you next time see you next, see you next time and so this was how our third season started. I hope you found this first episode interesting and useful and remember that you can find more tips and content related to our show on the internet, on the net, at the Weekly Mag TV. It couldn't be otherwise our, light, uh, our last words will be that of an architect. In fact, she was the first woman to receive the prestigious Pritzker Architecture Prize in 2004. The British newspaper The Guardian nicknamed her the Queen of the Curve. See you next week. Until then, remember to keep your English up and running.